I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, ongoing controversy regarding how Jews pray at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. I'm sure many of you know that after 1967, when Israel liberated the old city of Jerusalem during the Six-Day War, Jews are now able to stand at the wall which supported the western side of the mound upon which the Jewish temple once stood, known as the Western Wall, often mistakenly called the Wailing Wall, since Jews were observed by others praying in tears at the wall. And the government of Israel, over time, placed the administration of the Western Wall into the hands of the Orthodox rabbinate of Israel, which now treats the formal area where Jews stand in prayer at the Western Wall as an Orthodox synagogue, which means that there is a mechitza, a wall that separates men and women who come to pray at the wall. And in the women's section, women have been restricted from engaging in activities which would contradict Orthodox Jewish law, such as reading from a Sefer Torah scroll at the wall, or from women's wearing a talit, a prayer shawl, which in Orthodox Judaism is seen as a man's garment only. For years now, there have been attempts by women's groups, especially the group known as Women of the Wall, led by Anat Hoffman most notably, to gain greater religious freedom for women who do want, for example, to wear a talit, or who do want to read from the Torah scroll at the wall. And this controversy has gone on for years. In an attempt to solve this dispute between the Orthodox rabbinate and those who support women of the wall, Natan Sharansky, who heads the Jewish agency, proposed that a third section along the Western Wall be built as a non-Orthodox synagogue so that men and women could stand in prayer together and so that women could engage in egalitarian rituals freely and without restraint or interference. Now to many in the Jewish world, this idea of a third section of the wall, egalitarian in nature, sounded like a sensible and valid compromise. But nothing is simple in the Jewish world, and there is growing opposition to the compromise that some have found quite surprising. The egalitarian section of the wall has been built further down along the wall, near what's known as Robinson's Arch. It is not located next to the well-known plaza area where Jews pray now in a men's section and a women's section. And the fact that this third area is located at a different section of the Western Wall has created controversy of its own. And it's most interesting to see where the opposition is coming from. In part, opposition is coming from the Orthodox Jewish world. And to explain why, we're most pleased to be joined on our JBS phones once again by a marvelous individual and one who is a supreme spokesman for Orthodox Jewry, Rabbi Avi Shafran, the Director of Public Affairs for a Good of Israel of America. Avi, welcome back to JBS. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for your kind words. Avi, you know I love you very much, and I think, again, you represent the position of those in the Orthodox community extremely well and fairly. Avi, what's the real opposition you and others have in the Orthodox world to this third section of a Western Wall where men and women can stand together and where women can practice Judaism any way they wish? Well, there are two levels of, of objection here. One has to do with the very fact of these um, neo-rituals being done in, a, in close proximity to the Temple Mount, where, of course, uh, when the temple was standing, uh, such things never took place, and there was a certain um, standard of praxis, and that these um, feminist and <clears throat> non-Orthodox um, means of expression um, we see as out of place in that in that locale. Obviously, they go on uh, throughout Jerusalem in any uh, any synagogue that is not affiliated as Orthodox, and uh, there may be feminist uh, Orthodox organizations where the women read from the Torah publicly and whatnot. But we do see it as something of a um, 
of a, an affront to the holiness of the place. But that's, of course, from a strictly orthodox perspective. Yes. Uh, there's another level, though, that I think even a non-orthodox person uh, might be able and should be able to appreciate, and that, to me, is the main aspect here of our objection. Our objection is that no longer will the main, what's currently the main hotel or Western Wall Plaza and area prayer area, no longer will it be what it has been since 1967, which is a place where Jews of all sorts, whether they're ultra-Orthodox, or national religious Orthodox, whether they, women cover their hair or they don't cover their hair, whether the men wear hats or don't wear hats or don't wear anything on their heads, where all Jews uh, were praying together and no one bothered anyone else. On the contrary, it was seen as a, as a great unifier, as a place, probably the only place in the world where Jews of, of radically different attitudes toward what, it mean, what Judaism means were able to stand and pray in the presence of each other. And by setting aside a place for Jews who um, find it an affront to uh, adhere to the uh, ancient traditional Jewish Orthodox standards, um, to set aside a place for them where they'll be isolated there and leaving the uh, traditional Jewish community to be isolated in the, uh, the Mechitza section where there's a, a barrier, a, a temporary uh, light barrier between the men and the women, uh, to, to us is a, is a tragedy because now the split that we see so much in so many areas of Jewish life and yet was not evident in the Kotel Plaza for, for so long is sort of being formalized. And I, I think that that's a very sad development. Okay, so you're really talking about the sociology of this third section of the wall. Let me try to express what I think those who would disagree with you would say to you. It would be wonderful, they would say, if there could be a third section at the Western Wall, on the Western Wall Plaza, so that men, women, and you know, Reform, conservative, non-Orthodox Jews, women, whatever, would also stand on the same plaza, but in their own section. But the reality is that the Orthodox community, and certainly the Orthodox rabbinate of Israel, as you've articulated, feels that it is some way an affront to Jewish law, to halakha, for there to be non-Orthodox practice of any kind, at, certainly on the plaza. And what's interesting to hear you talk about your first objection, it seems to me you, you believe that any place along the Western Wall has the same orthodox sanctity that the plaza has. I'd remind you, Avi, by the way, when the city of Jerusalem was liberated in 1967, it did not immediately become under the, it did not immediately fall under the orthodox rabbinate, and there was a period of time when we could go to the wall. There was no mechitza at all. And then, for political reasons, the mechitza was then added. But the notion that people have that the wall itself is an orthodox structure, when the reality is the wall itself was part of a retaining wall that held upon the top of it the mound where the temple was built. There is no inherent orthodox sanctity. And I'm not trying to minimize the extent to which orthodox Jews do give that wall orthodox sanctity. But there seems to have been an attempt to compromise, to find an accommodation, which since there was not going to be a third section on the plaza, Let's create a third section down, and, and people who have been to Israel and have been to the wall know that the part by Robinson's Arch is really a very far distance from the plaza section. And people have a sense that they're, while standing at the Western Wall, are in a different area. And in this different area, although you're right, it would be lovely if we could all stand on the plaza, we can't stand on the plaza because it would be too offensive to the Orthodox community. This at least gives Jews who want to stand together or women who want to pray in their own way have a piece of the Western Wall, which is the better of the two evils. The better from their perspective would be, let's all be at the Western Wall as you describe. And it's a wonderful scenario you describe. But the reality is that Jews who have an authenticity of their own 
outside the Orthodox community can only find a way to be at the wall if there is a third section. And so my, you know, my question for you is, although I understand why you would see it as the lesser of the choices, do you see any validity in creating a section for non-Orthodox Jews that is along the Western Wall, but separate from the plaza where there is a mechitza? I see a logical validity to it, but I still bemoan it as something that I think is very sad. Let me just address a couple of the points that you articulated very well, and I know are on the other side of this issue. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to first note that even though the wall uh, is, not, is not wholly in a particular sense, either to uh, non-Orthodox or to Orthodox Jews, yes. The, it does bound the Temple Mount. In other words, on the other side yes. of that wall yes. is, is a uh, holiness that we, as Orthodox Jews at least, believe um, remains even with the Temple's destruction. I understand. So, so the Kotal Plaza does retain a specialness. I wouldn't call it a holiness per se, mm -hmm. but a specialness in its proximity to the sanctity of the place where the Beit HaMikdash, the Temple, uh, existed 2,000 years ago. I would also note that, even though I, I fully understand that back in 1967, there was, at least for a while, there was an unsure status of what we should do with the Kotel Plaza, uh, it became pretty quickly established that the numbers of people who came there, and there were large numbers of people then, as there are today, thousands each day, for the most part, certainly the regulars were all people who were Orthodox, whether they were ultra-Orthodox, as the term goes, or, or other, other shades of Orthodox, there were people definitely who felt that this, this was a prayer space for the Jewish people and that it should follow uh, traditional Jewish uh, standards. Now, those standards do not interfere with a reform or conservative or secular or atheistic Jew uh, in any real way. And this is the main point I want to make, is that we're not talking here about what prayer book anyone uses or what prayers one recites. We're talking about very, very vocal, in-your-face, demonstrations almost of what is maybe not intended as an affront to the Orthodox uh, normal regulars there, but is an affront to them, and I think in some cases is intended that way. If you look at some of the, uh, the writings of some of the women of the wall, they, they sort of are having a civil war among themselves now, those who are happy with the, the new decision and those who are upset at it because they say we must liberate, that's the term they use, the traditional Western Wall Plaza, and they insist on having vocal, in-your-face, loud services, which is what really caused all of the ruckus over the past uh, decade or two. Um, I think that that is just not a what we call in, in Yiddish a menschlich way of approaching something. It's just not a, a proper, polite way. One doesn't have to express oneself in a way uh, that uh, interferes with somebody else's prayers and somebody else's peace of mind. Okay. There's nothing wrong with women going up to the wall and praying in any way they want to. Obviously, they might feel a little bit put upon that they're on one side of a mechitza, but that's not the end of the world. The men are on one side of the mechitza I also. Understand. And, and they might, they might uh, chafe at uh, being asked not to, uh, not to have bare shoulders or, you know, or, or uh, very immodest clothing. But anyone who's been at the Kotel knows that... that uh, there are women dressed in all sorts of ways there, and that there are men of all types who are there. It, it really has been, until 20 years ago, nobody was bothered by it. There were plenty of non-Orthodox Jews who came to the Kotel. Every American tourist came to the Kotel. And nobody thought to uh, interfere with what had, by then, already become the normative practice of a, for better or worse, Orthodox place. Avi, you know, on the one hand... I understand your position, and I appreciate your being willing to always come and express it. And if we disagree, we disagree. And um, with that. It, it is, you know, it's a different world now. Judaism and, and the world as a whole has a different perspective. And what you're seeing here is the evolution of a certain kind of Jewish consciousness. But it is always so wonderful that you make yourself available to me. And I thank you once again for joining us in JBS. And it's more than, more than my pleasure, and I appreciate your, your presenting all sides of the issue. I would only want to just conclude by noting that I think what it all comes down to is which ideal is more important to any individual.
individual who's looking at the situation. I understand. The idea of preserving one's personal means and mode of expression, or is it the unity of the Jewish people in the last place on earth where, there, where it's evident? And to me, uh, I, I, I come down on the, on the second. Avi, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Mark. Be well. Good luck to you and all. Be well. Rabbi Avi Shafram, the Director of Public Affairs for Agudath Israel of America. And you uh, heard some of the things he says. It's not only Orthodox Jewish groups who oppose the establishment of this third egalitarian section of the wall. There are Jewish feminists who also have objection to it. And one of the most vocal and eloquent of all opponents is a woman who actually was one of the founders of Women of the Wall and who remains one of the most articulate and passionate defenders of women's rights, both in general and on the Jewish scene. And woman, I'm pleased to say you've seen off and on JBS, Phyllis Chesler, a psychotherapist, a former professor of psychology and women's studies at the College of Staten Island, a prolific and gifted columnist and author, and a most outspoken defender of the Jewish people and the state of Israel, especially when it comes to anti-Semitism and the BDS movement that seeks to undermine the Jewish state. And Phyllis, it's always a wonderful pleasure to have you back on JBS. Thank you, Rabbi Mark, very much. <laughs> uh, you know, I did hear the very last points that Rabbi, Sh Rabbi Shefron was making, and I must, I must address some of his points before presenting our case. Okay, because I want to make sure you have time. You, it is so fascinating to read your, okay. your piece in it, tablet. I don't want that to be lost. So just no, no, take it, a quick connected. moment to respond. In your face demonstrations, consisted of men freaking out on their side of the very tall mechitza and throwing heavy metal chairs, curses, physically assaulting, diapers with excrement, with excrement in it and bottles of water. That's a demonstration. And that was only in response to women, very piously learned women, halachically praying on our side of the mechitza in an all-women's prayer group very much like the prayer groups that Orthodox feminists pioneered in North America in the 1970s. So, on the other hand, I agree that the legal decisions that we kept obtaining, and we have now obtained the legal right to pray in the Ezra and Hashim with a Sefer Torah, with Talasim, with Tefillin. You're talking about the women's what section the of the wall. What's issue is the enforcement of that legal okay. right. That's the women's section of the wall on the yes. plaza. We wanted actually unity. We didn't want to desert the Orthodox women who wanted to pray but needed a mechitza and couldn't say certain prayers. And we respected that. We wanted the unity, at least, of all the denominations among women at the Kotel. Elsewhere, different shuls, different, different styles. So we have been, from the beginning, purposely almost feared, demonized, and misunderstood. What has happened just now is a little bit terrible and a little bit funny. Because remember, Natan Sharansky, a few years ago, in secret meetings, mainly with the reform movement leadership, came up with what I called the Chalom from Chelm, because I knew the archaeologists would lay their bodies down before they'd allow any interference with Robinson's Arch as an archaeological site. And I feared that the Waqf, as they're now threatening, uh, would view any change of Robinson's Arch as yet another example of Israeli aggression and imperialism against Muslim holy sites. And they're also saying just that now again. However, as the women began to be arrested and jailed and not allowed to bring in a Sefer Torah, can you imagine if they did this to Jews in any other country? You would say this is anti-Semitism. Israel, who has been brilliant in protecting the religious rights of every religion, has in this instance failed the religious rights of their own women. All right, let me ask you a couple of questions, Phyllis, because you say it beautifully. One of the things you write in the piece that is published in Tablet, if people have not read Phyllis Chesler's piece in Tablet, they should go and you should go and do it. It's called Not a Victory, and there are some very dramatic 
statements Phyllis makes in the piece. But it's one of the things you point out is you consider yourself an Orthodox Jew. And what you're looking for is an Orthodox Jewish expression on the women's side of the Western Wall on the plaza. Yes. What you don't address, and what I want to hear you address here is, and you do contrast that to what the non-Orthodox movements in America, Orthodox, I'm sorry, conservative, reform, and to some extent Reconstructionist, that their goal is not simply to have Orthodox women have the right to do certain kinds of things at the wall, as such, read the Sefer Torah. What the non-Orthodox progressive movements of America have wanted is there to be a place where they could express their yes. Jewish style, and that seemed to be most effectively accomplished by creating a third section. Yes, it's not I as agree. beautiful. I agree. The Robinson's Arch creates the kind of problems you des described, but I want to know why Phyllis Chesler would want, would choose to, to eliminate that option no, for no, those not Jews. Me. No, I said all along that the both reform and conservative movements should launch their own lawsuits fighting for the right to a third section at the Kotel proper, which would mean women only, men only, and then mixed gender minion. And at the Kotel proper, even, even if it would mean some time sharing, because there are those among us, but Selim, also at Sinai, who cannot bear the sight of a woman laning from the Torah, who feel it's a desecration of Judaism, okay, then these hours don't come, so you don't have to be offended. So I was in favor of that. I could not believe that the movements didn't do that. What they did instead was hire Anat Hoffman, use our struggle for halachic women-only prayer at the Kotel as a way of piggybacking on our sweat, blood, and tears, so to speak, with, to then, at the end of the very long day, say, now we want in, we want a smidgen of recognition. We want however small a sign that we are legitimate. And we'll take Robinson's Arch. And why do you think, so I think the mistake was for the movements not to fight for their place in the sun, in their own name and in their own right, but rather do a stealth fight behind our backs, only with the collusion of Anand Hoffman and her loyalists, to take away from us our legally obtained victory to do halachic women-only prayer in the Ezra Nashim. Take it away from us, because this cabinet decision is hoping that it will do just that, that then there will be no more women in a group out loud, the Kol Ram, with Talesim or Tefillin, and heaven for fan, not a safe Torah, and they can go back to having an even more Haredi shul there. So this victory is basically celebrating the further Haredization of the Kotel. This is not a victory. Okay, I want, I want to point out, for those who might not understand what you're saying, in 2002... Four judges actually voted that there could be, in the women's section at, on the plaza, certain kinds of women's tefillah and women's rights, as long as it was uh, women only. There was no egalitarian nature. And what you're arguing in part is that the, all of the attention given to Robinson's arch undermines a ruling by the Israeli Supreme Court that already has validated women who want to pray in their own way and do you know, some things, including reading the Torah, on the women's side. And so your objection is that because Jewish movements in America are focusing on Robinson's Arch, it is undermining what Orthodox women might want to achieve in the women's section itself. Aharon Barak ruled the fifth decisive vote, saying, go to Robinson's Arch. We did not do that, except when absolutely necessary. We also were only asking for 11 hours a year. Why would you voluntarily choose 
No, no, no. It wasn't me. Number. Lawyers, meetings, and advice. I didn't choose it okay. voluntarily. Let I, me just I'm... make an important point. In 2013, Judge Moshe Sobel, bless him, ruled that we're within our legal rights, Right. To do everything in the Ezra right. Nashim, and he so ordered that it should that the arrests have to stop, and they did. But what happened after his? So we're legally, we've won our struggle in the Ezra Nashim, women only. We won it. However, the administrator of the hotel, Shmuel Rabinowitz, passed a nochal, a kind of an arbitrary, maybe it's not legal, who knows what it is, a kind of rule that we couldn't have a safe Torah. So a few times our women snuck a safe Torah in. Is this the Spanish Inquisition? What mm-hmm. is this? Or brought in a very, very small safe Torah that wasn't, couldn't be found. So this, this is a victory, but it needs to be enforced and fully understood. However, the meetings grew more intense between the denominations from North America and the counterparts in Israel, with the collaboration of Anad Hoffman, who got rid of all the women who didn't want to be part of any kind of deal, threw them off the board. And now, what do you think that the cabinet announced on this particular day? We have a dream, we have a deal. I'll tell you why. Most probably it's because the Center for Justice for Women in Israel has two very major lawsuits now, new lawsuits, before the Israeli Supreme Court and one before the the Jerusalem Magistrates Court. The Israeli Supreme Court is demanding equal protection, non-discrimination under Israeli law in public places. It's a very strong lawsuit, very strong lawsuit brought brought by Susan Weiss. And this means that the government might have gotten worried that we might win or that the court might say, you know something, they're right. You know, this does violate Israeli law. You can't have 150 Sifrei Torah on the men's side and zero on the women's side. Something's wrong with that picture. It's a public place. It's not a shul. It's not a synagogue. So I fear, I suspect, I think that this deal that was so long in the making and may never come to pass, given the difficulties involved, uh, was announced right now, one day before or one day after the state had its deadline to respond to our recent lawsuit. And, of course, they asked for an extension, and, of course, the court has given them an extension. Look, Phyllis, this is a subject that deserves a lot more attention. Again, I'm going to recommend to everyone that you read Phyllis's piece in Tablet. And, you know... I have a slightly different take on it than you, although I do understand what you're trying to achieve. Oh, let me hear. I'm out of time, so when Uh. we come in studio, we'll do it. My own sense is that the notion that what what non-Orthodox Jews should be working for is a third section on the Kotel Plaza. I agree. It's so far, far, far. It's messianic that, again, Uh. having Uh. a spot on Robinson's Arch Uh. is the best of all Poor solutions. Thank you Thank so you. much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Phyllis Chesler, one of the most courageous feminists on the world scene and one of the founding members of the Women of the Wall. And as you hear, she has her very strong views on what should be done with an egalitarian, not an egalitarian, a women's section on the plaza itself. And there you have it. An Orthodox Jew who represents mainstream orthodoxy, who says the third option somehow is not not what he would choose, and you have a feminist who says she too is disappointed with the accommodation, and there are many of us who feel that, again, it is the best of all alternatives, a spot on the Western Wall where people can express egalitarian Judaism and where women are not harassed for doing whatever they want. At the same time, Phyllis's point deserves attention. We'll continue our look at this very complicated and controversial aspect of Jewish life today. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, and the producer of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.